Hello Internet, Seth Skorakowski, and it's been a while since I've done one of my list videos, so I figured, hey, it's about time to do another. And since the last one that I did was over Game Master mistakes, I figured this one should be about player mistakes. Now, there's a lot of different habits and tricks that make for a good player. However, just having these habits and tricks isn't actually enough. The key to that is the right amount. Sort of like adding a pinch of spice onto a meal to enhance the flavor, that is good as long as the spice is appropriate for the meal being served and that it's the right amount instead of using a whole dump truck load on top of a meal and it ends up destroying the entire thing. And that is the big theme here excess. When something good stops becoming good, it ends up becoming detrimental. Kind of like video intros that take too long. Point taken. Well, without further explanation, five good player habits that can go bad. Number five, addicted to flaws. I love flawed characters. I think they add a whole lot to the game. Whether it's Indiana Jones's fear of snakes, Tyrion Lannister being an alcoholic dwarf, or Adrian Monk being Adrian Monk, imperfect characters are fun. However, there is a point which a player giving their character flaws in order to round them out can end up descending into madness. Okay, so Captain Grimbo is a spectacular pilot, but he's also a scoundrel. His charm and seduction skills are through the roof. Now, while he isn't the most skilled at small armed fighting, his combat specialty is hand to hand. Okay, yeah, this sounds like a great fit for our space smuggler game. Oh, wait till you hear the best part. About a year before the game starts, Captain Grinbo pissed off the wrong people, and they sold his body off for spare parts. And now Captain Grinbo is just a brain in a jar. A jar. Yeah, like a jar with a brain in it and all these wires and stuff connecting them. So does he like move around with like robot spider legs or something? Cause, cause I can work with that. No, I thought about that, but spider legs sound a little bit like a benefit to me. So his jar just has a handle on top of it and the other player characters are gonna have to carry him around. I see. So now he's a pilot. Does that mean they just like plug his jar into the ship and he flies around with his brain? No, I didn't have enough skill points for any interface skills because he was getting all his brawl and seduction, so he's just going to have to talk the other players through flying the ship. So just to be clear, he can't fly and he can't move. Does he have any weapons or combat skills? Nope, he's just a brain in a jar that the other characters have to carry around. <laughs> he is going to be awesome. Some game systems require that a player character have flaws, and either the player either chooses from a list, or they have to roll randomly from some big master list somewhere, while other game systems have a point-by system where a player might purchase this many points worth of flaws, but in exchange they get to buy this many points worth of benefits. However, for a true flaws addict, they don't need a rule to require them to do this, and they don't care about getting benefits in return. Really, they just want the flaws. Dude, you said you were going to play the frontline fighter. Yeah, that's why I wrote up the Black Knight. The Black Knight, after he lost the duel, he hasn't got any arms or legs. We have to carry him around in a wheelbarrow. He's just a well-rounded character, unlike your perfect little Mary Stew. Many of these flawed player characters might sound like a lot of fun in concept, and they might make for some great NPCs. The problem with them being player characters isn't just that they can become detrimental to the party because they have so many flaws. The actual problem is that the player can quickly bore of them once the novelty wears off. And that leads us to number four, flavor of the week. These players are ones who can't stay excited about a character for more than a session or two before they begin to either tire of it or a newer and more exciting character concept catches their interest. Over the years, I've watched a lot of players tire of their characters for various reasons and they want to try something fresh. And as a game master, I'm going to accommodate for that. I don't want my players to play characters that they're not excited about. So between us, we'll figure out some way to kind of work one character out, possibly through death, possibly through retiring, as we're also working a new character in. And that can be a lot of fun. However, with Flavor of the Week players, it can become a frustrating habit. Not just because the game is in a state of constant flux, because these characters are becoming more powerful and more skilled with each adventure, and then they meanwhile have this string of kind of newbie guest stars that appear every single session, kind of like red shirts aboard the Enterprise. But it also becomes difficult for a game master to make any sort of long-term plans for a campaign because they never know from one game to the next what character that player is going to be using. A player tiring of their character happens 
reasons for a ton of reasons. Maybe the novelty wore off, uh, maybe their particular class or abilities weren't quite what the player was expecting them to be when they were doing the character concept phase. Maybe the tree of trying at level advancement is much more difficult than they originally envisioned, and now they're frustrated because it's taking a lot longer for them to advance and become more powerful. Those are all completely legitimate reasons, and they happen all the time. But for Flavor of the Week players, it usually comes down to one to two problems. First, either they don't see or they refuse to see the long-term aspects of the character, such as how hard it's going to be to advance or will they become quickly bored of this character, even if it's pointed out to them, they just refuse to see it. Or, and this is the one that's the most likely, is that they just really love coming up with player characters more than they actually like playing them. Number three, too paranoid. Some people might say that you can never be too paranoid, and while I do want my players to be careful, a little paranoia does improve PC life expectancy. There is a limit to that. At the end of the hallway, your characters come to a door with a bronze knocker. I check for traps. You don't find any. I want to check it too. And me. None of you find any traps. Then I want to check out that knocker, as well as the door frame, the ceiling, the walls, and then the floor. You spend an hour checking the room and find no traps. I don't trust it. Me neither. After finding zero traps, spending all your money, and spending a week, your preparations are finally complete. Okay, so the rope is connected here and here, allowing us to pull the door open from a distance. Now anything running out is going to hit these spike walls. Now we're also going to be watching this from behind a barrier, using mirrors to see. That way if it's a Medusa or anything, we're protected from any gaze attacks. Also, we've got a barrel of holy water to use against any sort of infernal or flaming creatures. And we've also got wax jammed in our ears in case any sort of audible attacks hit us. And we've also all drunk potions of water breathing in case any water comes bursting out of that door and tries to drown us. So with that all done, we open the door. After a hard tug, the door opens to reveal an empty room. <sighs> Well, that's it for this session, so hopefully next session we'll be able to get you inside the room, and at this rate, we'll probably take about 300 years to finish the adventure. I love cautious players. I want a little bit of paranoia in my players, that way they actually think about their actions before they take them. That's fun. And I get a huge kick out of watching whatever kind of goofy Rube Goldberg machine tactics that the players come up with because of their paranoia. But there is a line which paranoia grinds the game to a complete crawl and begins tapping the fun out of the game. Now the threshold of when that happens is going to be different for everybody, but there does come a point where players and game masters are going to look back on a game, even if they had a lot of fun during the game, but they end up start feeling dissatisfied and disappointed because the game is moving along so slowly. However, paranoid players still act. The game still does move, even if it is slow. But that's still a lot better than I can say about number four, indecisive. Your characters are standing before a low two-story tower with but a single door and window. Okay, so it looks like our options are checking the window or the door. This looks too easy to me, and I don't want to make the wrong decision. So let's think this one through. We could knock on the door and get that close. I could put a blunt tip on one of my arrows. That way we could knock on it from a distance. But that might be mistaken for us attacking, and I don't want to give the wrong impression. We need to list out all our options. <laughs> Okay, dude, we're stuck. What? D did you decide something? Nah, brother, we have listed every option we could think of, and we've ruled them all out. Can we get, like, an idea roll or an intelligence check? Because we just don't want to make the wrong choice. We're stuck. This is just too complicated. But you haven't done anything. There's nothing we can do. What about knocking on the door? And at one point you guys mentioned going back to town to figure out who lives here. But we don't want to leave here in case something happens. And we ain't splitting up the party. That is not an option. Guys, I don't care what you do. Just do something. I love players who think outside the box and come up with all their different options as far as what they can do. And I encourage them to have that behavior. But there does come a point where the players come up with so many options or go down such rabbit hole possibilities of what they can do that it ends up overwhelming them and they end up freezing up because they can't decide on which of these options to do. 
Now, in which case the game has now ground to a complete standstill. Now, most of the time, an action, any action would get the game going again, but the player's fear of making the wrong action is what's preventing that. This leaves the game master with the option of either throwing them a bone or throwing in some sort of outside variable in order to encourage the game moving along. Such as in that example video we did, we could have you know somebody step outside the tower and say, what are you guys doing out there? Or you could have a huge storm blow in and that encourages them that they need to flee for shelter. Maybe you could have writers come toward them and they look like they've got menacing faces and now the player character should should probably go in the tower, thousands of other options that could help push them along. However, with a truly indecisive player, having a game master that's going to throw them a bone or give them some sort of encouragement actually ends up becoming a crutch, because they know that if they just sit around and wait long enough, the game master is going to come along and give them an answer. Might not be the best answer, but it's definitely not going to be a wrong answer, so that way the players don't have to risk being wrong. And that indecision, that complete failure to act and making any action at all, ends up turning the game from being a game to really the player is just sitting around as the game master is telling them a story because the players themselves are too afraid to act. So game masters, depending on your situation, and everybody's got different situations in their game, you might need to impose a time limit where they have to come up with some sort of answer among this amount of time, or maybe you can start throwing in those outside variables like I was talking about. However, when you start doing that, you begin running the risk of either being railroady or not giving them enough time, or, which is just a bad, as bad, being accused of being railroady and not giving them enough time, uh, which that could all be alleviated, of course, if the players just made some sort of decision on what they want to do. Now, players, you are here to play. There is risk that your characters face. That's part of the fun of the game, right? But don't let your fear of making the wrong decision prevent you from actually playing the game. Every bad action that happens still moves the game forward, and that's really where the best memories do come from. And now for the number one bad habit, the negotiator. Your character falls into a pit trap and lands on 1d6 spikes. I don't think it should be that many. What? Why? Well, it's a d6 for a normal sized character, but Tidbird is very skinny, so we could like fall between them or something like that. So I think it should be a d6 minus one. The alarm sentry fires his crossbow at you from atop the wall. I think the sun's glare off the top of my helmet should give him a penalty. The fireball explodes, consuming you in flames and delivering 31 points of damage. I don't think so. Okay, why not? Well, you said that we were walking in a foot of water, so therefore one-sixth of my body is submerged. So if the damage is calculated because the fire completely consumed my body, then I argue that it only consumed five-sixths of my body, and therefore my damage should be reduced by one-sixth. Dude, you got hit by a fireball, you failed your saving throw, so it did 31 points of damage. Under normal circumstances, I'd agree. But I don't think it's fair to forget that everything below my shins was safe. Dude, just take the damage. I want to get back to the fight and kick this mage's butt. No, I'm doing this for all of us. I think we need to discuss this. As a game master, I encourage dialogue. If my players find a rule or a ruling kind of goofy, or they think that I'm not taking into account some sort of variable, they can mention that, and I'm fine with them mentioning that. However, several factors involved, such as the time and the place and the frequency that they voice their concerns, is when it begins slipping from a player having a good dialogue with the game master to them really just becoming an insufferable negotiator. Negotiators treat every game master ruling as an opportunity to debate. No matter how small or ill-timed it is, they feel obligated to haggle with the game master at every possible circumstance. Many times, the player isn't even that vested in the argument itself. It's not really something that they care about that much for whatever the argument is, but what they need is they need to win something from the Game Master. They need to win some sort of benefit from them. And that starts becoming the player versus Game Master mindset that I've talked about in other videos as being something that becomes very toxic to the game. But this need to win begins superseding everything else. And now the game begins moving at a very slow, jerky speed, kind of like watching a video over the slow 
slow internet connection, because every few minutes the game has to stop for another negotiation session. There's two big effects that happen because of this. Number one, the Game Master, being a human being, begins to become a little bit defensive by this, because they know that every time the negotiator opens up their mouth, they're going to be in for another debate. Which this makes them less receptive to any sort of actual criticisms or problems come up, but it puts them on edge, and it makes them elect not perform as well as a Game Master, but most importantly, it starts hurting their fun and their enjoyment in playing the game. Second, it begins annoying all the other players at the table, who constantly have to stop in the middle of the action to allow for another debate. They begin becoming irritated themselves, because nobody likes being around people that are arguing back and forth. Even if it is a, a, a nice conversational argument, it does begin to wear on you if you're always around it, and their own personal enjoyment in the game begins to suffer as well. So, when we go back to the social contract, which is kind of the foundation of my whole RPG philosophy, and I talk about it all the time, this is a legitimate problem, because one player is doing something that is hurting the enjoyment of not just the Game Master, but the other players at the table. And this is something that can lead to a larger problem of possibly a group dissolving because of it, or that player being kicked out of the group for, you know, being insufferable, when really it's just something that needs to be toned down. So, this is something that needs to be talked about. Now, whether you decide to talk about them with a group or one-on-one, -on -one, that's completely up to you, and that's completely on your circumstances. But the one thing that I have noticed with negotiators, as well as rules lawyers, who's kind of like the, the, the cousin to the negotiator, is that the offending player sort of perceives themselves as being a champion of the players as a whole. Like they're speaking for the body of the players, defending themselves to the Game Master, or trying to win something from the Game Master. So they expect the Game Master is going to be the one that brings this up with them, that tells them that they're actually stepping out of line, because the, the Game Master might be intimidated by their master their salesmanship, or their masterful debating skills, or whatever it is the negotiator considers themselves. So usually, it catches them really off guard if the person that brings this subject up to them is not the Game Master, but instead another player. A player who they thought was one of the silent people that sat behind them and they supported everything that they said. So we've talked before about how players, all players, needing to take some sort of part in these discussions when we're trying to help another player out that's having problems or is causing some sort of uh, issue issue within the group. This is one of those shining examples when having a player have the discussion with the offending player can be ten times more effective than simply having a game master do it, because of the perception that they're a player too, and they're, they're on the same side as the other one, and that can actually tell the negotiator that yes, this is a legitimate problem. Again, gaming is a group effort, and while a single player can cause a lot of disruption in a game, and possibly cause a game to go off the rails, it shouldn't just be the job of a single player in order to fix that. Because we are here as a group, it should be up to the group to help fix these problems, and discuss whenever a player is beginning to step out of lines. Especially in cases like these, where it's actually not a big problem of what they're doing, as long as they just tone it down a little. Hey, thanks for watching. So do you agree with our list? What'd we miss? Is there any bad behavior you want us to talk about in a future video? And of course, the usual like, subscribe, share, you know the drill by now. But until next time, amigos, stay awesome.